a big fan of the scaffold generator that can be used to quickly prototype different things in our applications. So if we do something like a generate scaffold for our users with a first name, last name, email, it'll automatically generate our controllers, the database migrations, and the views for us. The views are pretty basic, but they do look pretty good. So if I just run the Rails application, and if we run our migrations, we can go to that endpoint, and you'll see it doesn't look too bad off the bat. We can create the user and then go back to the index, and that looks pretty good. This application was built with Tailwind CSS, so a lot of the styling has already been created for us. And that's what we're going to look at in this episode, because if we are creating a new, fresh Rails 8 application, we already know what CSS framework we're going to be using, and we already know what the design should look like. If we are creating several different scaffolds, then that could be a lot of work to try to get them all converted over to the new UI or the UI that we're trying to create. And that's what we're going to look at in this episode. So in this case, the scaffold generator for the users created six different files for the views, and it does have a lot of the Tailwind CSS already created for us. But what we want to do in this episode is whenever we run that scaffold generator, it's going to automatically go to the look and feel that we are wanting for our application. So that anytime we create a new scaffold, it's already going to have the look and feel that we are wanting to get. So the first thing that we need to do is to go to GitHub and the Rails repository, and then we need to figure out where the templates are actually being generated from. It's actually under the Rails ties. And then if we go into the lib folder, Rails, and then we can go to generators, ERB, and then under the scaffold, and then templates, we finally find all of the different files. So in order to override these, we are going to have to copy these into our application. So we can come under the lib folder, and then we need to create a new folder, and we'll call it the templates. Within there, we need to create an ERB folder, and then finally, we can create the scaffold folder. How you want to download each one of these files is up to you. We can download the raw files, and that'll work. Or we can go into our lib folder under the templates, the ERB and scaffold, and then we can use a wget. We can paste in the link, so this will grab the show, and we can do this for all of the files as well. So I'll go through and do this for all of them, and that should be good. So now when we generate our scaffold for the users, I'm going to add a force to override. So it's going to skip the identicals, but then it force overrides all of the views. And we can relaunch our application to see what we have. Going back to our local host, we'll go to the user's endpoint, and this doesn't look really good. So I would have thought that this would have had a similar feel, but it actually doesn't. You'll see that it's very different. So we need to look at what was actually generated. Under the views, we have our users, and then here's all of the different files. And you'll see it's much more plain. It lost all of the Tailwind CSS styling that the original scaffold generator had created. There's actually a good explanation for that. That's because we do have the Tailwind CSS-Rails gem, and this gem has its own generator templates. So if we go through and look at these scaffold templates, these are going to be very different than the one that comes with the normal Rails. So instead, I'm going to download all of these and use these instead to simply override what we had before. So now our templates are much more aligned with what we would expect with Tailwind CSS. We can rerun the generator, run our Rails application, come back and refresh, and that looks a lot better. So that gets us back to what we had before, and now we can start updating the template. So one of the biggest changes that we may want to make is to the index page. Right now, if we look down around line 17, you'll see that it's just rendering the singular table name, which, when that gets generated, that's going to just render the user, which is rendering the partial. And we may not want that. Instead, we may want it to render a table. So that's when I'm just going to come in here and we can start modifying this. And there could be some weird things that you may need to do. So I'm first going to get rid of that render partial, and then we can create the view that we want. So I'm going to wrap our table in a overflow X auto. We can then create our table. Again, we're going to use some CSS classes. And then we can get into creating our head. We'll give this a class with a background gray of 50. 
and then we can create our row for the header columns. But this is where things get a little bit tricky because we do want to get our attributes and we want to loop through each one of these. However, we may not want to loop through all of them. For example, by default, we may want to reject if there is a password underscore digest, but then we can loop through all of the other attributes. And so we'll create our table heading with a scope is equal to the column. We'll give it a class and I'm just going to paste in all of the classes that we'll need. We can then have where we take in our attribute and we want to get the human underscore name and then we can close this out. I'm going to go ahead and close out the table head and also the table. We'll close out the div that we created. And so that should look good. And so that looks good so far. And now I want to go ahead and generate this before we go further. And then I want to have a look at what it created. So far, that's not too bad. We got our column headers and it looks good, but that's not the only thing I want to look at. I also want to go up and look at what it created in the view, because in reality, this is what we're going to have to maintain. And I'm not so enthusiastic about this. I don't like the extra spaces that we have in between each one of the headers. And typically for a header, I would prefer it to be styled like this, where we have the header names in line with that header tag. So that means that we do need to make some changes in here. And this is where things can get a little bit tricky. When working with the RB, we can add a dash to the beginning and end. And we can also do this on the end. And that's going to clear any of that white spacing. So making that change alone, and then also bringing up that attribute name to be in line with the header tag. Let's see what that looks like. So we'll go ahead and save this. We'll run the generator again. It only updated the index, which we would expect. The view still looks the same. But now when we go back to our index, you see that looks a lot better. But there is one problem because I used two spaces for my indentations. But in the template, it actually generated four spaces. So we would need these to be moved over to the left. And really, I don't know of a good way to do that, except to break the indentation styles that we have here and just pull that table header to the left a couple of spaces. So now when we go to rerun our generator, we should see it's identical because we already changed that in our users index and have saved the changes. And so that can kind of be another litmus test that you use to see when you rerun the generator if it's identical or not. And that's of course going to be based on did you manually make the changes? And if you find that it didn't give you quite exactly what you're looking for with that file open, you can just undo redo to kind of see the changes in the view to see where you may still need to update the template. So now we can continue on with the body. So we'll create our T body. We'll give it a class. We want this to be a background of white and we'll have some other Tailwind CSS classes. And then we want to loop over everything. So typically we would just do our plural underscore table name. And that would actually be an instance variable, but that's not really going to work here because this template generator, we actually want to generate some ERB tags. So we do need to use two percents instead of just one. That means that we are going to want to generate the ERB. And so we want to generate the at symbol, but then we need to generate what the plural of that table name is. We can loop through each one of these, creating a block. And then again, we need to use the ERB to take in the singular table name. We'll close those and also close out that block. And then we can end the ERB. And so this can take a bit of while to fill everything out. And luckily, we do have some of this already set up from the generator that you can use as inspiration. But I'm just going to go ahead and copy and paste it in because it is a lot to type through. But basically, what we're doing is creating our table row. We're then going to loop through each one of our attributes again. We'll have our table column and we're doing a lot of different checks if it's an attachment. And if it is attached, then we're going to create a link to that. Otherwise, if we have multiple attachments, we're going to handle those a little bit different. We're then going to list out all of the file names and a link to them. Otherwise, we're just going to have our record and then the column name. And of course, we'll have our actions. Maybe in this case, instead of the destroy, we just want a view and edit. 
we also need to have another column for the actions, and that's going to be in our head, and we'll just call this the actions. So we can save this. We can then generate our scaffold again, and it should have just generated the index. We can verify that everything's looking good, and if everything looks good, we should be able to come back and test this out, and that looks great. And so a lot of this is really going to depend on a few different things. How often are you going to be using the scaffold generator? If for each new feature, you're basically using this and then just cleaning up the different things that you don't need, then spending some time in creating these templates could save you a lot of time down the road. And the cool part is, is that it's not limited to just the scaffold views. If we were to go down under the rails, there is a controller and under the templates, there's a controller RB template file as well. This is going to be for just the normal Rails generate controller command. It's not going to work on the scaffolds. But if you wanted to, you can create a Rails folder under the templates. You can then create a controller folder and then copy that controller rb.tt into your application. But because we are using the scaffold generator, instead, I want to scroll down a bit more. And then there's the scaffold controller. And under the templates, we have the controller rb.tt as well. And this is the one that I want to use. So we can create a new folder. We'll call it the scaffold controller. We can download this controller file and then we can copy it in. If we wanted to, we could have a before action and then maybe do something like a user signed in. So that way, when we go to generate the scaffold, not only are we updating our views, but we're also going to be updating the controller. And you'll see that this automatically added in the before action. If you don't like all of the comments that it creates, you can delete these as well. And if you don't like how the default rails indents the private methods, you can pull those back as well, rerun the generator, and now in the user's controller, it's much cleaner. So again, if you are generating controllers and views often, then it'll make a lot of sense to spend the time to create these different templates for the controller and for the views. However, if you're not creating scaffolds often, and instead you just generate controllers and the actions and the corresponding views, you can follow still a lot of these same concepts. For example, under the ERB, the controllers, there's a template for the view. Maybe you don't want that default heading with the controller in action and the find me in the path. Instead, you may want to generate your own views. That one may not be as useful if you are more accustomed to using the scaffold generator, but it can still be very helpful. So I'll put a link to these in the show notes so you can see some of the different things that you can override if you're wanting to override some of your own templates. And some of them make sense to update. And in other cases, it really wouldn't. Like the authentication, I'm not going to spend a lot of time creating my own views in these templates because this is kind of a generate once kind of thing. Instead, I would focus on the things where I'm touching much more often. Well, that's all for this episode. Thanks for watching. For more videos, check out driftandruby.com.